Hello, hello, and welcome to Hello, this is Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 193 for July 12th, 2023. The revolution will be automated? I am Merwat, that is hometown.com, and up there is the AI. And that's loud music. Go ahead. I know, I'm afraid to talk. Uh, good evening, hometown citizens. Yep. Welcome. Oh, great AI. I know that you allow me in your graciousness to do this show as a mere human. <clears throat> Even though I am, I'm not really trapped. I'm happily the mayor of Ometown, and Ometown is a, a, a merging, I guess, a, a confluence, a, a nexus of electrons trapped in a wire. And you know, if you were to break out uh, like a FLIR, uh, thermal sensor um, imager, you know, and you point it at a wall, you might actually find the physical location of Ometown because all, all data points flow into and out of Ometown. It's a, it's a virtual community entirely online in the wires, in the tubes, so to speak, right? A little bit of resistance a hot spot of of knowledge experience wisdom stories a community and it all flows through hometown.com and we also do the show here on twitch and then it gets copied over to youtube and it gets copied over to a podcast oh and we just activated our tiktok <laughs> I never thought that I was going to do a TikTok, um, but <laughs> we had a couple of really, really interesting uh, articles and we're going to start doing that uh, more often, or I should say the mayor is going to start doing that more often, um, putting uh, a couple or more, as many as I guess um, I get the gumption to um, put them over on TikTok. So you can actually just go to tiktok.com uh, slash, and then it's always the at, you have to do the at hometown and that'll be there. So we're hometown over on TikTok. So if you're into TikToks, it was yesterday's show, the one about the uh, Ford escape doors <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the DNA camera is over there too. So we're, we're going to keep on uh, putting articles over there as well. Um, and maybe even start streaming over there. And there is a, a feature to stream, but not everybody get to, gets to do that. Um, so go over there and check it out and favorite it and like it and whatever it is. I, I don't know what the youth does on TikTok. You and your TikToks. I know the AI is just going, oh my God. Are you... I like it when the young folks get down verbally. Yeah, that's right. Or they yeah. like it when I get down verbally. They, yes, the youth I find enjoyed when I get down verbally. Uh -huh. That's actually from a movie, uh, Real Genius, uh, which if you've never seen it, it's an 80s movie. You'll love it. Uh, at least I think you'll love it. <clears throat> Anyway, um, we've selected 12 articles. Uh, there was one that was actually sent through um, Twitch chat by a, a, a community member. I don't know if they want me to announce that it was sent, but we're going to actually, we're going to um, bring it up tomorrow. Um, and um, we've added that source to the news pool um, because uh, that's kind of how it works. You know, if, if a new news source is found, we, uh, review it. And, and if we like what is being said and it doesn't seem to be, uh, abundantly biased, um, then, uh, you know, if the bias is so real that you can you know, cut it with a knife kind of a thing, then, um, I kind of distance myself from it the, and, and the news that gets aggregated because I want it more holistic, um, and not, necessarily deep one way or the other and i also want to challenge preconceived notions so we have a good spectrum i'd say 
Um, that said, we did pick already the 12. Um, and let's get into it. You you want to start talking about these uh, articles? I was I didn't get a chance to go through. I have a title, the little rundown though. I guess it's we're kind of deep in the reads here. So why don't we just get into the show? I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, the very first uh, article is about AI. <clears throat> it can't even tell you the chronological order of the Star Wars movies, which basically means that AI is all for naught. The tech news site Gizmodo has begun experimenting with posting AI articles or AI written articles. A recent article on the Star Wars films had numerous errors, the Washington Post reported, and Gizmodo employees are livid, saying the inaccuracies damaged the publication's reputation. Um, we are six minutes in, so I can't call this what it is, but it's the, yeah, obvious news. I'll just say that here. I'll filter my words and say it's the obvious news at nine. Um, yeah, another example of the fact that AI just spews out garbage. Um, this article is over at businessinsider.com. Um, Catherine Tangalakis Lippert is the, I may be the inflection may be wrong on that last name, but anyway, um, they wrote the article for businessinsider.com. And I can imagine just being told that Gizmodo is experimenting with posting AI written articles and then telling asking the Gizmodo employees, hey, how do you feel about an AI taking your job, literally taking your job? You know, if it turned everybody into an editor, then maybe, I guess, it's a job, it's a gig, right? Um, and maybe they can add their own, you know, flourishes, color, whatever it is they want to add to it, right? Personality but the data is aggregated from AI so that they can focus on the material. Although then there's no real reporting. It's basically just information gathering. And then if you're a journalist, you want to go out and do this. You want to talk to people you want to write an article from scratch, build it up. You're not just a talking head reporting news, right? That's not why you went into that industry, you know? Me, as mayor of hometown, I want to gather up as much information as possible, sift through it. That's why I built hometown.com. And then I want to talk to people about it. And while I do it every day, I started back in 2022, January 1st, 2022, doing it online every day. So that kind of, you know, satiates my need <laughs> for information. But if you're a journalist, you want to go out and write. Hey, just want to let you know, we're, we're giving your job to an AI. How do you feel about that? Yeah, they're livid. Oh, duh. So on Wednesday, about 10 minutes after employees at the outlet were told AI assisted bots would be generating news stories for the site, an article by Gizmodo bot was posted listing all of the Star Wars films and the TV shows in chronological order, and it was riddled with errors, according to the Washington Post. Gizmodo deputy uh, editor James Whitbrook told the Post he counted 18, quote, concerns, corrections, and comments he had about that story, including that the AI bot inaccurately listed the chronology of the TV series Star Wars, The Clone Wars emitted, Star Wars and or and uh, the 2008 Clone Wars uh, film from the listing and included formatting errors and repetitive uh, descriptions of the George Lucas universe. So again, <laughs> chat GPT may produce inaccurate information about people, places or facts. So let's scroll down and see if the article says that it was, oh, oh, look, 
The story was one of five articles published using Google's BARD and OpenAI's ChatGPT technologies as the outlet pilots new AI initiatives. Guess where I got that little caveat that is at the bottom of the page. That's right. I got That's it from, from ChatGPT. Chat Ta-da. So again, PSA, everybody, if, if, uh, if you're... I hope that you're not getting tired of the refrain because the, the people that are getting tired of me saying, don't believe what an AI says, unless it's a sentient AI and it's owned and operating within hometown, then it's a sentient AI. And I, you know, I'll delete this little paragraph, but, um, I don't, I mistakenly said that I own the AI. The AI is sentient. So it, it doesn't, it is not owned anyway. Um, uh, just a quick correction. Um, if you Look trust that, in a, you're already beating chat GPT, <laughs> the, uh, whatever they are doing, they need to vet the information. They need to do editing. They need to correct. But then but it's turned. I don't ahead. understand pulling data that's just inaccurate because then somebody has to re pull the data. So why do the first one to begin with? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could understand it if it was getting sources and citing it and, and was building, you know, a bibliography of the sources so that when somebody does decide to, it's kind of like having a paralegal constructing a document and then handing it to the attorney where the attorney has the ability to parse it really quick and then verify the information really quick. And usually the attorney knows most of the information as their years go on, but that's kind of how a writer works too. If they're in a particular domain, they have, you know, years of experience and it's usually built on gathering information facts. And if an AI just gathers it all up and throws it into a document and you can scan through it and go, this is correct. This is right. This is good. This is blah, blah, blah. Let's change this. But that's not what's going on. They're taking the data verbatim, posting it as if it's fact and it's BS. That's my problem. So get the human back in there um, and uh, let them be the ones that are actually vetting it for truthiness, I guess you could say. But we're watching this automation happen, which is why I titled today's episode, The Revolution Will Be Automated. Another uh, called the articles, perfect examples, how some executives clearly do not understand their customers, the readers, have only a very loose association with integrity and solely focus on cost and profit instead of quality and value. Again, I always say profit before people. Yeah, it's going to continue. So at the end of the day, um, the articles are posted over at the elections uh, page on hometown.com. So you go to hometown.com slash elections, but I'm going to continue to throw them into the chat um, as we go. And if I forget, I will uh, make up for it at the end. They might be out of order at that point, but you can always see them in chronological order if you go to hometown.com slash elections, you can click on the, the titles for each section and vote if you like that kind of article. Did you want to add anything to this? Oh, great AI. I don't even know where to begin on this one. Like I just, it seems like this was a, a an obvious result that was going to occur. Yeah, I agree. I just, I don't, I don't get it at all. With all of the warnings that have been coming down the line. Well, I mean, I guess maybe they're not paying, they're not listening to the show. <laughs> That's They're for news. Sure. How could they be missing it? It's all over the place. Like we have to weed out AI articles. There's so many coming through. Yeah, they're face And they're blind, almost though. all like issues in a different field. Yeah. Yeah, they have all kinds of factual information wrong. They have the construction of the document is wrong. It, they have multiple typos and, and multiple 
like sentence fragments within the sentence. It's really weird. Um, and so I, I don't know if at this point I'm really confused if it's just bad editing or if it's AI that's I think it's in. zero editing. Yeah. Oh, well, it's always zero editing when there's a problem like that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep going. Uh, the next article um, involves Taylor Swift and their Denver. Well, yeah, their Denver shows. Colorado Governor. This is in the Mobile Channel. Colorado Governor writes open letter to Taylor Swift ahead of Denver shows. Um, let's see. Colorado Governor Jared Polis wrote an open letter to singer songwriter Taylor Swift ahead of her planned concerts in Denver this weekend. Paulus welcomed Swift to Denver in the letter, saying that the city was waiting for her as she continues her era's tour, which is supposed to gross something around $1.8 billion. That's the estimate. Isn't that like all of California's GDP, something like that? I Don't hold me to that. I haven't looked at California's GDP, but anyway. Um, that would be about longer. half, of, roughly half of California's GDP. Oh, my God. Oh, well, that put me in my place. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I'm wrong. Wait. Oh, really? Sorry. I'm on the wrong order. That their um, GDP is three point five nine trillion. Trillion. That's not, right. Not billion. Yeah, not billion. And so I'm way off. As soon it's as I, I could see part of the snippet of it and not the full information. As soon as I said it and and heard it back, I was like, Oh no! Wait! 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 <laughs> California is like this massive. Um, GDP. It's a juggernaut. Um, here, let me throw this link into the. So yeah, well, it's like 1.8 billion dollars. One organization roaming around the United States. It's quite fascinating how big it is. So he worked um, the titles of many of Swift's songs into the text of the letter, referencing hits like uh, "Should Have Said No," "Wildest Dreams," and "Cardigan." Uh, I'm confident 140,000 plus concert goes will look back and say your concert was the be the best day straight out of their wildest dreams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Jared Gans over at the Hill wrote this article, and uh, let's see what else. Is, I'm not sure of the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, I guess it's just a, a friendly email. Um, Paulus is. Not the first political leader to release a statement in response to Swift's upcoming concerts during her tour. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, how many concerts provoke a political leadership response that they're coming to influence the economics of the state? I mean, I really haven't seen that. The only thing I can think of that reminds me of that is the Beyonce changing the inflation rate in the country and i forgot which country it was a country in europe sweden maybe that's that may not be it but um by the way this would be roughly equivalent to the gdp of uh, several countries but i'll pick antigua and barbuda um so i mean the point is <laughs> and that's number 189 on the on the list of gdp <laughs> Yeah, but the nexus is this one person for crying out loud, well, you know? Right, I mean, exactly. it's just amazing. I mean, it, it's outrageous. Wow. Well, they're working really hard at it, too. So, I mean, pretty much every day they're flitting from one concert hall to another to get this job done. So, pretty amazing. Um, let's keep going. So the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. Anchor Brewing, America's oldest craft brewery, shuts down after 127 years. The San Francisco-based company uh, was reportedly losing millions of dollars annually. Uh, this is an entrepreneur.com article. Madeline Garfinkel is the author of it. And one of two things seems to be happening in the adult beverage sector and that is merger and acquisition by only a few like Anheuser Busch um, is buying everything and its conglomerate organization um, or they're closing 
So something uh, basically you have to pick a side either you're going to close i'm surprised that they would be closed though the announcement comes a month after anchor halted national distribution limiting sales to california only revenue had declined by two-thirds since 2016 and the pandemic exacerbated difficulties as most of anchor's beer was traditionally sold through bars and restaurants well that's the problem there they should have pivoted if they could uh, to me i've heard anchor mentioned um, positively everywhere that I've talked to people about, you know, beer and alcohol of various kinds. I don't think anybody ever said anything bad about them. Despite attempts to expand retail distribution, the brewery struggled to make significant progress and was unable to break through in a big enough way. The anchor uh, rep told the Chronicle. Yeah, it's a bummer. Founded in 1896, anchor brewing, brewing, um, was considered by many to be the nation's first craft brewery. However, a 2017 acquisition by Japanese beer uh, giant Sapporo put the company's craft status in peril. The brewery ventured uh, into more trendy beer styles as well as introduced a modern taproom pilot brewery, began charging for tours. Um, I was listening to a conversation and I'm trying to remember where it was. Um, but it, there is a, a craft brewing convention that's taking place and has been taking place each year. And apparently I can't remember where I heard this anyway. I think it was a podcast. Um, they say that big breweries go to this craft brewing convention uh, but everybody basically just despises them you know might might get samples because it's free beer um, but other than that they don't like that big companies come to craft brewing conventions but they're the anchors that help fund so i guess yeah okay it's kind of like um like me saying hello youths how are you doing today i too am a youth um, no, I, I know where I stand, but I'm still, you know, a, a kid at heart. So, um, unfortunately, another small business, arguably, um, bites the dust. And, uh, let's see if they summarize this in some way. It says there is a possibility that a buyer could step in during Anchor's process of shutting down and selling its assets. However, Anchor reps told the Chronicle that repeated efforts to find a buyer have not yielded any luck. Well, if they've been converting their recipes to more standard processes and, and standard flavors, nobody wants them. They're not strategically positioned to expand anybody's operations. So why would anybody buy them other than to get, you know, uh, physical uh, storage facilities or um, uh, equipment because you're not going to necessarily need the people and the people that you do want are the ones that are brewmasters you know subject matter experts that might get a job anywhere what did you see I thought I had seen something about this recently and there was a, an announcement um about discontinuation of the christmas ale yeah um and i when i saw that i thought oh yeah i saw that article come through um yeah that's right so maybe that was kind of like a sign of what was coming yeah well i mean the moment that you pull back into a single state and you stop distribution uh, you're basically done um it's kind of <laughs> there are certain warning shots that should spook people um and you know, one of them for me is that when you start selling tchotchkes that have no tie to the actual organization and you're putting that shit out on tables in front of the enterprise, you might as well start counting the days. And if you're an employee, you might as well start, you know, eating ramen so that you can save up money because, you know, the fit is about to hit the shan. Um, so. It is what it is. Maybe they could uh, sell it to the 
employees and the employees can make it an employee a wholly employee owned organization and spin it back up because these kind of crowd owned organizations have a lot of people that have skin in the game so they are passionate about the product they're passionate about the organization um, but then again maybe they want too much money but some money is better than unwinding it all and just selling it off for you know parts um, because that's exactly what's going to happen to this thing if nobody comes in if nobody swoops in and buys it um, they're pretty much everybody's going to lose their job um, and that's a shame so because they hinted at a, a union and stuff like that so um, okay so let's move on uh, this is something that we talked about I think it was last week um, it's in the hometown daily show channel and uh, over on hometown.com videos show sea otter stealing surfboards in California as people joke that they've joined the orca uprising. Um, I had joked because what, what people were, uh, videoing video recording and distributing and going viral was a video of a seal, a baby seal climbing up on a surfboard and people were just kind of having fun with it and i said you know this is actually going to be showing other animals that you can just climb up onto the surfboard and us humans will be okay with it and uh, lo and behold <laughs> we see this um so let's go straight over to the source uh let me throw it into chat to pardon me one second okay so uh, videos show sea otter stealing surfboards in California as people joke that they've joined the Orca Uprising. Sophia Ankel is the author of this over at businessinsider.com. Um, and by the way, it was on the July 9th show that we talked about it first. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, not too long ago, huh? Um, sea otters in California are stealing people's surfboards. One otter who was filmed forcefully hijacking a surfboard has been captured and people are joking that they've uh, join the orca uprising see has been captured is troubling because this is brought on by humans you know um and we are in their world so you kind of have to ha have respect for the wild animal um let's see one sea otter in particular has been deemed a public safety risk after it aggressively hijacked a surfer's board off the shore of Santa Cruz, California. It was a video that was posted to Twitter. Um, you can follow you the link. This is, do you think this is related to the toxic algae issue? I don't know. I wonder if they mentioned it in the article um, because there was an issue further south though, right? Was it up uh, there? I don't think isn't it was this there. in the same area? Uh, I mean, this Santa is Cruz. In Santa Cruz. Um, let's see. Basically, the board was destroyed. The otter was captured and will mostly most likely stay in captivity. Uh, adding that the uh, this was not the first sea otter attack that he had seen in the area recently. So maybe it is. Um. Let's see. And they're, but they're tying it to this, to the orca issue, which, uh, is, has nothing really to do with it. It's not like the orca are walking that, you know, what, what was it? Dory, otters. <laughs> Dory <laughs> isn't sitting there sharing stories about how orca are, you know, beating the hell out of yachts. Um, let's see the U S uh, Fish and Wildlife Service told KTVU that the sea otters are showing concerning and unusual behavior and warned that people in the area should stay away from them. It is possible the animals are acting aggressively due to a, a humans constantly feeding them or hormonal changes, surges. Um, I, yeah, they're going through puberty. See, now maybe it is the algae and there's just enough that's seeping up there that they're losing their inhibition from interacting with humans and so they're climbing onto the surfboard i mean you might be onto something and i guess we'll find out 
in time. You know, not maybe not nobody's talking about it from that perspective just yet. Hmm. Yeah, I don't see anything else. They're not as cute and cuddly as people tend to think. Yeah, well, everything's cute from a distance. And then when it's up close and personal and biting your face off, you kind of shy away from it. Is that your test? <laughs> yes. As soon as I feel teeth on my face, I decide, oh, this animal's not as cute as it once was. <laughs> By the way, the toxic algae story was on July 1st, if anybody wants to go back to that. Gotcha. Um, and who, well, you know what? Maybe it's even in here. Hmm. Because I don't think it mentions sea otters. Nope. I mean, there but are other the things. Same here. water. Yeah. There are other articles related that are in Gnome Town that will connect you to additional external sources. So uh, go check out Gnome Town. Let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in hometown daily and e-commerce CEO is getting absolutely roasted online for laying off 90% of his support staff and replacing them with an AI chatbot. Once again, <laughs> the revolution will be automated. Read the room. <laughs> uh, Sumit Shah, the CEO of the e-commerce platform Dukan, laid off 90% of his support staff, replacing them with an AI chatbot. He shared on Twitter that the new chatbot reduced customer support costs by 85%. And the amount of reduce it by more than that when they lose all the customers and there's nobody to support. Re reducing the humanity of your enterprise uh, by 85%. Um, his post sparked an online backlash with one commentator, um, or really should be comment, commenter, uh, summing it up as how not to announce layoffs. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Uh, Kai Zhang Tu. Um, this, I've actually seen this picture before several times now, but it's a Getty image. It says an e-commerce CEO is getting absolutely roasted online for laying off 90% of his support staff. Uh, we've basically summed up this article, but there's always more. There's, there's a little bit more. It says uh, in the thread, Shaw wrote that an AI chatbot took less than two minutes to respond to customer queries while his human support staff took over two hours. Uh, well, I'd rather have the two hour wait and it get done right. And they research the question or whatever it is. Yeah. And how cherry picked is this? You know, the AI chatbot took less than two minutes to respond to customer uh, queries. What was the customer satisfaction level for both of those? Well, let's see if they actually say anything about it, right? Wow. Let 23 of 26 members of its customer support staff go. In the conversation on Wednesday, Shaw said that his monthly budget for customer support is now $100. Insider could not independently verify the figures. But Twitter and Reddit users aren't buying the explanation. As of press time, more than 600 Twitter users had quoted his tweet with the vast majority being critical of Shaw and Dukan. Yeah. I mean, it's a layoff for sure. And, but it's something that I've been talking about, uh, because, you know, like I've been saying, if you're, if your job amounts to a, a series of steps that can be enumerated in a, in an algorithm, then you are a program and a program can be automated turned into a physical bot or a AI bot. It's not even an AI. It's not even an AI really at that point. It's an FAQ that is triggered by inputs from a chat box. Um, frustrating for sure for many people. Um, but I'm sure that there are some CEOs out there that are part of startups that are hero worshiping this decision because it sets a precedent for more if they did it and extended their runway that much maybe i can do it too yeah, it really depends on the context so i would be very very 
careful um, with automating my entire customer support staff, or you'll end up without customers to support. Yeah, so that's the article over there at Business Insider. Let's keep going. Unless you want to add something. No, I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, I know you'll you'll come in like a wrecking ball, right? That's right. So uh, the next article is over in hometown daily bank of America staffer secretly opened credit card accounts for people without their knowledge and uh, damaged their credit scores. According to regulators, bank of America was issuing credit cards to people without their consent for years. The CFPB said the employees would secretly take people's credit reports and make bogus applications per the CFPB. The bank is ordered to pay $250 million in penalties for a number of offenses revealed Tuesday. Wow. Why is it doing this? I mean, is it to increase the number of accounts or something? Like, I don't understand what the point is. Well, um, before we get into that, the um, articles over at businessinsider.com, Matthew Lowe is the author. Uh, Why would people do this? Because they make money for, it's like a bounty. Um, So if they get people to open up a credit card account, then they get a bonus. Um, Since at least 2012, the bank staff wanting to reach their sales incentives used information from consumers credit reports to submit bonus accounts or bogus accounts, sorry, uh, bogus account applications. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau said in a statement, Um, I'm not surprised by this Uh, in the face of things like, um, you know, Wells Fargo historically, um, you know, anywhere there's a profit motive without, uh, significant oversight and auditing verification, fact checking, etc. You get abuses. Um, and when it becomes systemic or a matter of culture, like a la Enron or Arthur Anderson, you end up with these abuses and it, it happens in almost every single sector. When people think that they can get away with it, they get away with it. And if they get caught, then there's some downward pressure. But when even the boss says, yeah, go for it because I get a bonus when you get a bonus it becomes culture. The allegation against Bank of America is one of several announced on Tuesday by the CFPB, which ordered the bank to pay a a combined $100 million to affected customers and a total fine of $150 million. So I don't know if that's that and that, or just this $150 million includes that $100 million. Um, and the CFPB didn't disclose how many people were actually impacted by it. So let's see. Yeah, there really isn't anything in a separate case in May of 2022. Bank of America was also made to pay 10 million in civil penalties for unlawfully garnishing its customers wages. Later that year, it was fined 225 million by authorities for quote botching. Uh, payments of state unemployment benefits during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then it was also in 2014 ordered to pay $727 million for misleading consumers in marketing for its credit card add-ons. And then they mentioned <laughs> the Wells Fargo one uh, from 2016 was similarly fined $185 million for secretly issuing. See, that amount probably didn't touch on the total profits that were generated off of this fraudulent, but I'm sure some people got fired, but you can't put a corporation in jail. You might be able to shut it down, but its assets still go on, even if it's shut down. Silicon Valley bank, for instance. But you could Uh, put some of the people in jail who had committed this. I mean, I, they almost need to do that because obviously if there's no financial disincentive and if the banks don't get shut down over this kind of activity. I'm sorry. I was just doing banking practice. I, I didn't intentionally cause anybody harm. I mean, I, I assumed that everything was up and up. 
Sorry, I'm just an executive. I get reports. Do I survey the room? Yeah, sure. But, you know, I can't see when people are doing stuff. I'm just a, a bank CEO new to this planet. I'm not familiar with your strange ways like ethics, liability, accountability. Uh, the next article is over in the mobile channel. If you want fewer meetings, measure them in cash. This is actually something that I've done with people, uh, with organizations. I, uh, show them financially the loss, uh, due uh, the financial loss due to the number of people and what their opportunity cost is, um, for those people to be in superfluous meetings. Um, the amount of time dedication, them having to travel to a location for said me meeting, unless uh, obviously the, the threshold, the cost drops dramatically if it's all telework. Um, but in terms of overall costs, the more time you spend in a meeting, it may not be productive, although it is communication and it's, you know, building that trust and, and showing everybody that everybody is present and in the moment that is something that might be tertiary to the real goal here which might be saving money so if you want fewer meetings measure them in cash venture uh, is a certain corner uh, venture to a certain corner of the internet and you'll find an uncanny kind of social satire that of the wishful work design there's the made-up meeting punctuality score, which tells you who among your invitees are most likely to show up to brainstorm 10 minutes late. Um, and others, apparently. Look at that. That's a pretty office space there. It might look It cold is. Look at all the windows. Yeah, that's great. I'm much more familiar with the... Ubliette Ubl style of... Uh, business uh meeting room a ubliette is where you throw somebody to just make them disappear it's a prison um oh. typically a hole in the ground so not quite that uh inviting <laughs> <laughs> yep there's the made up uh, i mentioned at the beginning of the statement that there's the made up meeting punctuality score which tells you who's going to be late to a brainstorming uh meeting or the fictitious LinkedIn nepotism disclosure, which adds a label to tell which manager is actually just related to the boss. I see that often. Um, in this alternative digital world, software plays the banality of emails like music. A version of Zoom lets you skip played out intros like a Netflix series and a feature of Google Calendar shows the cost of useless meetings before you call it. That might be something that we need to draw a little bit more attention to it's a Twitter link. So I'm not logged in, so it won't show me. Um, Shopify is making employees calculate the cost of meetings before they go on the calendar. So today, July 12th, an e-commerce company Shopify announced a new tactic directed at dropping useless meetings, a cost calculator. <laughs> there it is. Look at that. I don't even know need to go into greater detail. This is just perfect because if the cost equation for your meeting doesn't surpass this, you don't need a meeting unless see there's this, there's the intangible elements of a meeting that you have to calculate in. And if it's weighted in this, um, then fine. You know, oh, okay, this meeting is going to cost $2,100, but our total interaction is going to lead to, you know, a, a net profit of, you know, $25,000 for this 10 minute meeting or 30 minute meeting. The cost calculator is here to challenge the status quo, nudging our teams to consider, reconsider uh, meeting a necessity and explore more creative collaboration methods by integrating the tool into the team's workflow. Um, they add it, the person is Kaz Nijation. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they add the idea is to surface costs in a way 
that's immediately noticeable to employees without having to change their day to day. This though, um, might lead to the disclosure of certain personally identifiable information, um, such as, well, for a meeting that's set up for an hour, these seven people on average make $300 an hour because it's $2,100. Right. And it might also lead to morale issues like, oh, wait a second, I know I'm, I'm not, not making, making a seventh of that or whatever. Exactly. Um, so everybody's making more than me or some people are making more than me or yeah. whatever. And sometimes it's obvious, you know, like somebody who is an admin versus general employee, it, it's pretty obvious that they're going to be making more typically, right? However, <laughs> when the disparity is so great because you have five people that are making $50 for that hour um, and the total cost is $2,100, you know that there are three people up there at the top that are C-suite or something like that. Usually it's not C-suite that's going to be doing that. But anyway, and you're not going to get C-suite for that price anyway in most organizations. Anyway, the rise of the meeting cost calculator, the idea of calculating uh, meeting costs isn't entirely a new one uh, I would never assume that. Um, in 2016, the Harvard Business Review released an app aimed at putting a price tag on a meeting, plenty of online tools that you track the cost of the time you put it on the calendar. But this, this is taking into account uh, Shopify's payroll. That's how you get that educated number. Um, any other time, if all you're doing is putting a bunch of people on a list and then estimating it, then you're literally, it's a shot in the dark. You have no idea what it is, but when it's an internal process, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit too on target. Well, and even if you put it at minimum wage or something, which would obviously be much lower depending on the industry and the type of worker, I mean, it's still, I think it's an eye opener, particularly if you're in tons of meetings that, and if it causes meetings to drop off, that might be a good change. I think it'd be fine for management to understand what its team, what their team operational costs are for each meeting. And so you can go, look, we're wasting our time with this meeting. Let's just pop in, say our hellos and goodbyes and get out because we don't have anything that is absolutely actionable today um which i'm certainly i'm i'm actually guilty of that spinning up a meeting and then assessing what is actually uh actionable and if we need to triage more stuff and then just cancel the meeting but usually i give ample warning uh, but sometimes you need to get the band back together just to talk um and that, that can sometimes be the more ephemeral value way beyond this. Um, so uh, Quartz throws in their two bits about it. They say like any other uh, workplace, Quartz has its own complaints too. Their newsroom compiled some suggestions for the digital tools that target some of meetings worst offenders. Um, virtual meetings prone to going overtime. Yeah, that's usually because people are a little bit chill. You know, they're not as anxious to get the hell out of that meeting room and get back to work because they don't want to stay late. Everyone on Zoom gets a digital torch and allotted speaking time, which I'm not really into this whole, here's the conch, go ahead and you can talk. Um, that actually drives me nuts. Um, I, when I'm in meetings, when I'm talking to crowds, I, I don't like breaking the flow of discussion. But when it gets out of hand with everybody talking all at once, then I do rein it in, but that's up to me. Uh, it, it isn't the, here's the stick, you can talk. You know, it becomes Lord of the Flies kind of thing. At the scheduled meeting time, swelling orchestral music plays over the speakers eventually so loud. That is the only thing anyone can hear. That never happens in any meeting I have ever been to in the last decade. Um, the only time it ever has um, is at an event styled, 
um, meeting where it's in mass, like 300 people are attending and they're just playing music to everybody until somebody starts talking and then they chop it off. So. But I like the shark one. Did you see that? No. It Wait, what is it? There. Oh, it's up above? Uh, it's basically uh, you get a shark oh. chasing you and if you don't stop talking, <laughs> you get jaws. I think I, that's why I, all I did was read the very beginning of it. I didn't continue. They need to complete their thought within 30 seconds. I, yay, yay. There's a, what is it? There's a, I can't remember where it is. There's, a, it's a club, like a comedy club, but it's a, for um, those who want to go on stage and, and like do an act. And if you, if the crowd thinks you suck, they just come and yank you right off the stage. Not the crowd, but they use like a, a shepherd's hook, you know, and pull you off the, the stage. Um, I don't know if they do that kind of stuff anymore, but uh, it was old school. All right, let's keep going. The uh, next article is over in Hometown Daily. Vermont flood damage is so severe it can be seen from space. This is something that I actually had my eye on for uh, a while since it started um, over the weekend, I think it was. And um, it, it got pretty bad. There's been a lot of social media about it. Um, do you have any observations about it? or? Uh, no, I haven't actually seen much about this. Gotcha. So here, let me throw this into... I'll, I'll um, play catch up real quick. Sorry for the dead air, folks. I'm going to um, copy some stuff into chat so that chatters can follow the links um so vermont started flooding uh, i haven't found out why it all is but my understanding is it's climate change related um anna skinner over at newsweek.com which is uh, sorry anna skinner over at newsweek.com put the article together um but the whole claim that it's you know environmental and and um uh, climate change related is kind of like that no shit news, you know, at, at nine kind of thing. Yeah, that's right, the it's catch all. Like, look at the news any day, and it's some weather is going haywire. Yeah. Um, it says the worst of the flooding occurred in such places as Newport, Montpelier, uh, Middlebury, and Springfield. Um, if I recall correctly, this is basically the Montpelier area. Um, yeah, according to uh, a Tuesday flood warning from the National Weather Service, the flooding severity was second to conditions during the Great Vermont Flood of 1927, which is considered Vermont's worst natural disaster and was spotted by satellites in space, images of which were shared uh, on Twitter. I don't think that they're going to okay, have any Okay, so pictures. that's the worst in almost 100 years, so that's not good. See, but everything... Particularly since this is like frequent weather events yeah that's true um but everything old is new again so this is the once in a hundred year storm satellite images of the winooski river showed what now looked like a widespread lake after the floods once flooded the river expanded past houses and roads montpelier was overwhelmed with flood water and drone footage revealed the floods extended through the capital downtown yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody is really reporting it all that much, uh, like streaming wise and stuff. I don't think anybody is really streaming it, but um, social media has quite a few of these little snippets. So let me, let me play this one and see. So yeah, once a stream or river overflows, it becomes this. Um, and this erodes the roads and the sidewalls of dams and pretty much everything. And then it becomes a flooding hazard, um, breaking the banks of things that used to just be creeks. So be safe out there. Yeah, that's horrible. Sorry for the dead air. Um, if you're in the podcast, then 
Uh, we're basically watching a video that's in the link um, that's in the VOD and the show notes um, and uh, in hometown and you'll be able to go over to the Newsweek article. Did you see something? Well, there was a weird um, statue or something which caught my attention, but see right there. Oh, the dog? Yeah, <laughs> which I thought was unusual. Um, but it's interesting because when you see pictures <laughs> of Vermont, you typically see these green, uh, you know, hills and like red barns and things along those lines. And this doesn't look like the Vermont you typically see in the pictures. Yeah, maybe the maybe I can't see what the shirt says, but it says maybe this is the flood height where um, the ride. If you're not this high, then we're flooded. Yeah, right. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> If you're wet up to it, this level, the road is flooded. I probably shouldn't joke about this kind of stuff, but it's a coping mechanism, folks. Uh, the next article is over in the Mobile Channel. You're not imagining it. The ocean has changed color over 20 years, study determines. The discovery offers the first clear evidence that human-driven climate change is shifting the color palette of the seas by disrupting tiny marine organisms called phytoplankton. These long-term changes in color can open a new window into the health of the ocean ecosystems that could inform marine conservation and governance in an age of rapid global warming. I think it's been day after day after day of increased record temperatures um, we are going to end up with a uh, flaming ball of magma if we keep going the way we're going. But um, I don't know. Uh, the articles over at vice.com by Becky Ferreira. The study that analyzed 20 years of satellite observations has confirmed that oceans are becoming greener over time due to climate change. And I think that means the color green, not better uh oh, eco-friendly <laughs> yeah they're not becoming eco-friendly um the discovery offers the first clear evidence that human-driven climate change is shifting the color palette these long-term changes in color can open a new window into the health of the ocean ecosystems anthropogenic climate change which is caused by humanity's consumption of fossil fuels is already affecting earth's oceans in countless ways um, ocean observing satellites can see the shifts in marine chlorophyll, but snagging a clear signal of anthropogenic uh, climate change from this colorful noise is difficult uh, due to the large variations in phytoplankton activity from year to year. Previous research has suggested that several decades of chlorophyll observations from space would be required to pick out signs of climate change in ocean color, and they've done exactly that and have seen exactly that. So guess what, folks? We are the cause of our own, <laughs> I guess, destruction. Uh, that sounds really dark, but um, after reviewing re uh, research on the topic, Kale told Motherboard that he realized that Modus Aqua was just about to have its 20th birthday, knew that NASA was thinking about Aqua shutting down, and thought, well, there has to be more signal in the full color spectrum than one number chlorophyll that's often estimated from it there is less noise in the individual colors than in that number and we're probably never going to have another chance at a 20-year single satellite record if we are ever going to see a climate change trend in ocean satellite data it would have to be now so let's see so they examined the data and showed um, significant changes in color area, uh, sorry, in color across 56% of the ocean over that time, mostly in tropical regions within 40 degrees of the equator. That could not be explained by natural annual variations in phytoplankton production. So they basically showed that uh, things are not aligned with what should be expected as per a color change that's seasonal. And 56% of the ocean is a pretty significant area, I would say. Yeah. Um, and it's in a particular region that gets the most sunlight. So maybe there's a threshold 
where if more sunlight i'm sure if they track it with another you know, 20 years and they put a, a higher quality camera on there with a broader spectrum they might actually see that variation go deeper out you know wider region from the equator you just don't necessarily see it with that particular data set maybe they drop down deeper or uh, it's a different shade or whatever um let's see one possible driver of the co color changes according to kale is a climate fueled stratification of nutrients in upper ocean uh, waters which could cut off sources of nutrient to these tiny life forms so, yeah that's kind of what i was saying um and that stratification may just be something that they could see with a higher quality uh, camera so or surveillance system but obviously we need to maintain this we need to keep on monitoring this because it's not like oh well it's only been 20 years and we found something but nah we don't need to bother paying any attention anymore because we already have the data yeah they'll they'll keep on doing the research i think uh, fortunately nasa plans to launch the plankton aerosol cloud ocean ecosystem or pace mission um the uh, first global ocean hyperspectral satellite in january of 2024 pace will be able to see hundreds of subtle colors on the sea surface and has the potential to revolutionize how much we can interpret how changes in color reflect changes in ecosystem in ecosystem state according to kale so all i have to do is scroll down a little bit and uh, i answer my own questions so pretty neat stuff um, i love satellites the the functionality of satellites is amazing um, for the first time though in my life i've seen direct impact on the planet from a satellite in orbit which was that green laser scanning over hawaii um, that that chinese satellite um, that's right the single most dis disconcerting photograph video that i've ever seen was that um <laughs> Because I don't know what that actually represents, you know, in, in the real world. Like, why the hell is there a Chinese satellite scanning Hawaii? Um, and then there's, since then, there's been shenanigans out there um, off the coast of Hawaii and stuff. So, I don't know. I, I don't really like that kind of stuff. Um, but satellites in general, I love them because they can uh, pierce through the canopy of forests and see what's underneath and i'm really interested in ancient archaeology um, the archaeological history that has been literally buried for thousands of years um, i want to see it i want to i want the history of it i want to know why it was buried how it was buried um, it, it just seems kind of odd to me that a lot of the planet seems to be buried under eh, two to 20 feet of dirt um, all done over 2,000 years like, why does that happen that doesn't make any sense to me I don't know but we see it over and over again yeah I've been told it's erosion but all right Let's keep going. Uh, this one blew my mind when I saw this. This is in hometown daily. Um, fisherman swims 15 hours to shore after whale throws him overboard. Uh, they're quoted as saying, thank God for giving me another life. I was born again. Mm, I don't know about that. You were lucky, buddy. Flavio uh, Barcelo. Um, uh, was apparently thrown off of their boat by a, a whale pandora dewan over at um, newsweek.com put this article together swam for 15 hours to reach dry land after the incident which happened in the middle of the night off the coast of ecuador unfortunately his two crewmates didn't survive the three friends had set sail from the port of san mateo in ecuador uh, on the evening of July 4th to fish for Corvina. Um, and apparently it says that night, my partner who knew him as uh, Heriberto or Silo uh, told them or yeah, told me that I was going 
ahead, I should be on the lookout for a whale or boat, Marcelo told local media outlet Extra. We were advancing and I told him, watch out for a whale, but it was too late. We hit the whale and fell into the water. What size boat was this thing? Yeah, they don't that say. That doesn't show. I'm really curious. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, to me, it seems weird. But I guess it happens periodically. What's up? Well, I was going to say, we've been seeing a lot of whale strikes um, yep. in the news recently, but we haven't seen this type of uh, event. Yeah. I've never seen anybody get pulled off of their boat, knocked off of their boat. Um, pretty shocking. But maybe they're all talking to each other in some language that we don't understand because it seems like it's becoming a concerted effort nowadays. I'm starting to think that whales are the uh, sandworms of Dune. But here on <laughs> Earth, they're in the water. Make a big enough noise, you get a big enough whale. They're at the right scale uh, and it to comes be and, comparable to that. And it comes and kicks your butt. Yeah, let's keep going. This next article is in the hometown daily channel as well. A European airline is buying train tickets for its customers on a 108 mile journey to encourage passengers to fly less. <laughs> I don't quite get this, but okay. KLM CEO told Politico, we are moving our customers from plane to train. The Dutch airline has been buying tickets on the high speed Thales or Thales, um, Thales train from Amsterdam to Brussels. That 108 mile journey is the same distance as wall street to the tip of long Island. That seems like a, do that many people take a flight 108 miles? Maybe. I mean, what are the cities that they're traveling between? Well, what they said in here is um, going from Amsterdam to Brussels. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Right. I mean, all right. Is the only other. No, that can't be. The only other way is by train. You either fly or go by train. Um, we're moving our customers from plane to train. Um, so they're buying tickets traveling between the capital cities of the Netherlands and Belgium takes, uh, 45 minutes by plane, one hour and 38 minutes by high speed train at 108 miles. That's about the same distance as going from Los Angeles to San Diego or wall street to the tip of long Island, which it, I mean, it's, you know, an hour and a half drive really. Kalem is uh, doing this partly to pressure uh, on the aviation industry to reduce its carbon footprint, but the airline having launched a fly responsibly campaign back in 2019. This is interesting. Um, but I suppose, you know, if it works, then it works. I just don't like being in a, go ahead. I was going to say, it's just odd coming from an airline since that's their business. Yeah, exactly. Although the pilot scheme also found it needed easier transfers for passengers, luggage, assistance, and communications with customers who might be unfamiliar with Thales. Um, these obstacles must be removed before KLM can permanently replace flights to and from Brussels with rail capacity, the airline said in a press release. Permanently? Do they own KLM? Like, does the, the train company own KLM or vice oh, versa? I see. I don't know. Huh. Might have to look into well, that. Well, there one. it says it has no control over the trains, so. Oh, so no. Yeah, I guess not, right? To accomplish this, KLM will need all of its action plan partners to cooperate. After all, it has no control over the trains, the railway platforms, or the airport. So KLM is just out of the 
kindness of their carbon footprint, they're buying tickets. But it doubles the flight time or the the travel time, which travel time, right? I don't know. Uh, unless I'm in my car, I would rather not be double the di- double the time in transit. Uh, because I might want to break off and go do something else instead of just do that straight shot. Um, right, if and it's it looks like possible. you could travel by vehicle. I mean, not surprisingly, if you could travel by train. But um, but you're crossing um, country borders, so I don't know if that's more challenging for travelers. Right. I guess it depends on if those are part of the um, like the Schengen agreement where you can travel freely. Right yeah some treaty or something gotcha um with the right id i suppose you could bounce from one place to another with relative ease because they wouldn't set up a high-speed train without having that process in place um okay let's go to the last article uh for tonight this one's in the mobile channel i had to get this one because it seems like everybody needs to (laughs) um much older people need anti-money laundering lessons um and it's not 10 year olds so uh, i'm really curious about this article again we don't read the in depth of this article um while we may have experience in some way with this stuff um we don't read the articles until we actually go live on the show um the ones that we select we're normally filtering through hometown with regularity but anyway uh the articles over in mobile uh, over at uh, hometown.com 10 year olds get anti-money laundering lessons um and they're the, this is all that the source provides so uh, let's go over to the telegraph.co.uk madeline ross is the uh, author of this article school children as young as 10 will be taught about the dangers of becoming money mules to stop them falling victim to dreadful schemes. That is not the take that I got from the, the uh, <laughs> title of this 10 year olds get anti money laundering lessons. The deck statement is campaign launched as school children targeted by fraudsters using social media. Oh my goodness. Social media is also being used to target school children as criminals encourage them to set up crypto wallets to launder money with scammers openly advertising for underage squares. In the first six months of this year, 17,286 cases involving money mule activity were filed to the CFIS, I guess, um, National Fraud Database, including 3,881 where people aged 21 and under were involved. <laughs> this is shocking. Um, yeah, I just, I can't, I can't believe this. In one case, uh, for students to discuss features, a young boy called Josh, who is duped into opening crypto accounts for 500 pounds a week. Another example offered is that of Lauren, who's tricked by a friend that she met online into helping hide money. So I'm really curious if anybody out there that hears my voice uh, has ever run across something like this. Um, Because this seems... uh, Of kids? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it comes really close to the meme level Nigerian prince saying, hey, I've got $16 million. But is that really what's happening with this? I know that the other way is a phishing attempt to get confidential information so that you can they can do a, a transfer from a bank. Um, well, and that is legitimate, right? I mean, it happens and that people yeah. fall for it regularly. Yeah. yeah, that absolutely does happen. So a letter for schools to send to parents advises families not to contact anyone. Uh, they suspect of organizing money laundering criminals use the bank accounts of the money mules to launder cash made from human trafficking drug dealing fraud and even terrorism and offer substantial rewards for participants um and back to the no shit news it's illegal to allow fraudsters to use your bank account to clean money and uh, mules can also be sent to prison for up to 14 years under money laundering legislation you can't acknowledge this as a 
lessons for money mule, potential money mules and then go hey you can be put in jail if you act <laughs> as a mule because obviously ignorance of the rules is significant enough that you're trying to teach 10 year olds that they can be held accountable I mean, I would have found this article pretty shocking if it was even, say, high school age or something. But yeah, yeah, this is this is very interesting to me. And I would love to see some stats on because I understand under 21, but that doesn't necessarily reflect what age it's happening at, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I mean, they mentioned under 21, but they're actually t- highlighting the fact that they're trying to teach 10 year olds about money exactly. laundering for crying out loud. So how did they get to that? For example, are half of the ones at age 11 or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so that's it for tonight's show. But um, I do want to uh, say that we're going to have uh, an article that was submitted um, today, earlier today. Um, but because I review all, all of the new sources that get aggregated into Ohm Town, um, the article um, wasn't included tonight, but we're going to include it tomorrow because it actually speaks to something that I'm interested in as well as the fact that um, it was submitted um, and is an interesting article in and of itself. So it's kind of like a, a, a trifecta of a um, uh, what I'm going to refer to as a citizen of hometown until they tell me that I can disclose who it is that submitted it um, and give credit where credit is due for the submission. Um, and uh, m- my personal and professional interest, <laughs> um, as well as the fact that, well, it's, It is interesting in and of itself, not just my personal interest, but it is interesting in and of itself. It's quite fascinating because it's one of those things where you don't want to, you don't want to meet your heroes, you know? Um, And uh, I'm sure if we peel, I I haven't read anything beyond a little bit uh, beyond the headline, right? That way I don't taint my reaction because a lot of the show is really a reaction to the news. Um, What we see is what you see at the same time. Um, And so (laughs) when, if I start laughing about something or start crying about something, that's my honest reaction to the news. Um, But I'm typically not, you know, really bombastic and boisterous about things. Um, But when you find out about certain things, you just kind of go, damn, I really wish that I didn't know this um, because I can't, I can't separate. Like if an actor treats somebody like crap in the real world, I can't separate their actor status. Right. I, I don't want to, if like, I don't want to watch the flash anymore because the actor in the real world is a tool. You know, I don't like that actor in the real world and I can't separate the two. Um, there's people that I, are, are in my sphere where they're like, well, you know, I don't really like that person. Um, but dot, dot, dot. No. Well, no, I, if I don't like that person, I'm not going to have I, I'm not interested in communicating with them. I'm not going to buy them a beer. I'm not going to want to hang out anywhere like during lunch, you know, at, at a lunch counter somewhere if I have to have a meeting with that person, I get in, get out, that kind of a thing. I, I don't want to socialize because I don't like the person. Um, and that's kind of what this speaks to like, Oh God. Um, but the context of the article, um, was really fascinating too. I can't give it away. I don't want to give it away, but I want to talk about it tomorrow. So there might be a little bit of soapboxing. Hopefully I don't scare anybody away. But at any rate, that's it for tonight. We always bring you back to the front of uh, Ohm Town, the welcome sign, so to speak, on Main Street. And then we uh, go through the front page really quick. See if there's something that we can talk about. I'm looking to see what's on there. Um... Let's see what else. I don't know. 
Oh, wow. I mean, that's kind of dark, but it talks about Russia yeah. sending in high uh, soldiers. Yeah, that there's actually, it's. I've seen other articles about that. Kia to invest $200 million in Georgia plant to build EV9 SUVs. That's interesting. That is. Um... Mm. There's some sort of Bitcoin blackmail scam. Oh, boy. Targeting your crypto and privacy. Apparently, Joe Biden said, I'm 198 years old. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you feel that way. Sure. There has, I'm sure that there's like context to that. But, I'm sure, but it's funny. Yeah. yeah. You might be 198 years old. We need your birth certificate. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. That's I guess that's it. We'll find some. Oh, there it is. It <laughs> so this is going to be an interesting conversation, folks. Um, maybe, um, once I get better context and we talk about it, but I've always been this proponent of returning land, but, um, there's this, there's this issue with the whole stolen land versus whatever. I mean, colonialism is the, everything was taken over by colonialism. Um, so like giving back the land for this area versus that area it it seems like a small step um but you have to just admit that we don't know the historical context of the land acquisition but a lot of it was by force and a lot of it was through what might have been contractually and an invalid contract because there was no true meeting of the minds perhaps because different languages different contexts different social understandings of what ownership is of land <laughs> um anyway it's it's always a little bit deeper and cultural relativism is very substantial um, as time moves on you might think that well now it's too late or that or something like that which is absolutely true because you can't you can't say that the land and its value today is what the land and its value then and its future if untouched by any colonialism would amount to the same it absolutely would not you can pretty much separate that idea and say it's not possible for it to be but the value is a nebulous concept. <laughs> what I value land at and what somebody's uh, spiritual connection to land is worth are two different animals to the different people that are talking about said plot of land. It's going to be an interesting conversation. We'll see if we can get to it. Um, well, we'll get to it tomorrow, but just how much, how deep we go um, is uh, a matter of debate. So. That's it for tonight. I am Mayor Watt. That, all the way up here at the top, is ometown.com. And up there is the AI that's going to evaluate my performance today on the show and probably fire me. I'm not sure. I really don't know. <laughs> and say goodnight. You want to say goodnight? Yes, great performance, and oh, good night, hometown citizens. We'll see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern and probably earlier for other shows. And if you're in chat, I appreciate your time. Thank you. You could have spent it with anybody, and you spent it here. Even if you're lurking, you are appreciated by uh, Mayor Watt and the AI. So we'll see you tomorrow, I hope. And if you uh, get up the gumption to talk uh, to us here in chat, do it. It'll be fun. I promise. Cheers.